had a couple of presentations on talent attraction, retention, and promotion. And I am going to turn it directly over to Gail Blackstone to get us started on today's presentation, workshop, and discussion. Gail. Good morning, Madam Chair, or good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, uh, Gail Blackstone, I'm the Director of Human Resources, and I'm very pleased to be here. I just wanted to note that uh, County Manager O'Connor had let me know that he was finishing up some work and wanted me to specifically note that he will join us just as quickly as he can this morning, this afternoon. So he should be here shortly. Um, coming up online here um, very quickly uh, is Sandy Blazer as far as our presentation today the Deputy Director of Enterprise uh, Team within a Human Resources. Um, we have Ann Feyman as our Deputy Director of the Talent Team. And then um, notably, Nolana Gates, who is our newest um, in a new role with us as a, our Public Pathways Coordinator. So very pleased to be here today on behalf of the strategic team for this Committee of the Whole. We're here to talk further about one of our four major themes that we're working on under our talent attraction, retention and promotion strategic priority, which is often referred to as TARP. There are four major areas of focus within our, our TARP work. Theme one is working on our values work. Theme two is about HR uh, as a strategic business partner to the organization. Theme three is uh, our work on mod modernizing our personnel rules. And theme four is modernizing our classification and compensation systems. The focus of this comprehensive work is to ultimately have Ramsey County be recognized by our current employees and talented job seekers as the premier public sector employer in the region. Our team was here before you in a workshop on December 1st presenting an overview of all of our work happening here under theme two, HR as a strategic business partner and our work to enhance HR processes and systems to support, to align with our culture and values work in support of the organization. The team also presented in a board workshop on December 15th regarding work on our competencies and the development of our performance management system. And most recently there was a board workshop earlier this year with our consultants and Gallagher on their work with, with us on our classification work. So without further ado, I think I want to turn it over to um, the team starting, I believe, with Sandy Blazer to kick off um, the presentation for you today. Sandy. Good afternoon. I'm making sure our presentation comes up here. Are folks seeing that yet? No. There we go. And if you want it there. Um, good afternoon. I'm Sandy Blazer. I'm Deputy Director with uh, Human Resources for the Enterprise side of our operations. Um, I'm here with Ann Feyman, who is our other Deputy Director, and then you'll also hear from Noe Gates, as, as Gail indicated. I'm going to give you just a, a little bit of background. You have seen this slide uh, previously when we've come to present to you. Uh, we, we call this our strategic pillars slide. Uh, this is our work around um, HR as a strategic partner. And we have created this as our model for, for HR. Uh, it is created from the TARP uh, as a strategic priority aligned with our mission, vision, and values. You'll see our values laced at the, the uh, bottom of our, our pillars um, as part of the foundation of what we do as strategic um, partners with the, with the organization. Um, foundationally, we are all about excellence and execution of HR administrative processes. We've got a whole body of work around that. Today, we're here talking more about um, the, the pillars and about developing and delivering on the talent strategy. Um, in addition to being able to do that, we, we will need to know and advise on business operations, as well as, as being a champion of the employee experience. So these, all of this laces together to create our strate strategic partner model for how we will deliver HR services as we go forward. It is built on the idea of an employee life cycle as well. And if Anne, you wanna to move to the next slide, that would be great. Um, 
So the the employee life cycle is the the various parts of the employees. Uh, time with us. Um, again, this is built on the vision of the county, a vibrant community where all are valued and our mission, um, and translating that into the employee experience. It starts with culture. Um, it moves on to the recruiting and talent acquisition, onboarding and learning, um, taking the circle all the way around with, again, our values being at the center of that as part of our HR strategy. Again, today we're gonna to be talking about recruiting and talent acquisition um, and, and giving you more in-depth information about how we are uh, going to be leading in this area as we move forward. Um, and anything you wanted to add to either of these uh, sort of foundational models? Um. Other than to say that we're reflecting or intentionally reflecting the goals of the county in terms of investing in employees' um, well being, uh, and that includes, right, creating a culture in which employees can prosper, uh, and then making sure that there are opportunities for employees to prosper, both in their learning in their initial position or in terms of succession planning and their growth here at the county. Or if uh, we grow individuals here and they either decide to move on to a different position within the county or move on to a position um, outside of the county that, you know, the time and experience that people have spent here has been a time where they felt that they uh, belonged, that they felt that they grew in their positions, um, that they had an opportunity. And then the blue circle that goes through each of these pieces of the of the life cycle, if you will, um, is really an accountability piece. So making sure that our leaders, um, as well as HR, is accountable to our employees in terms of creating this culture where everyone can thrive. Thanks, Ian. Yeah. So um, I think our, our next slide starts to go in a little bit deeper into what we're here to talk to you about today. Um, again, uh, some some focus on the excellence and execution and then deliver developing and delivering on our talent strategy. Um, Anne's going to provide you some deeper information. The talent strategy is really focused in our general services side of our organization, which is the, the side of the organization that Anne oversees. Um, so she'll be providing you some information about the, the uh, plans uh, with with uh, her team and where that's going to take us. So I'm gonna pass it over to you, Anne. All right, thanks, Sandy. Okay, so um, hello everyone, uh, commissioners. I am Anne Feynman, I'm the deputy director of the talent team, as Sandy mentioned. Uh, and today we're here to talk to you a little bit about our work streams around the work, what we're calling the work of general services or our service delivery model uh, with that team specifically and then our hiring process improvement. And as Gail mentioned, um, we were here in previous workshops um, around strategic HR for an overview of our work in um, December 1st. We did a workshop for all of you to, to talk about the many work streams um, that we were, that we have been working on for some time, especially during the COVID response as we were um, waiting our way through this work to keep it going and keep it alive because we do value our employees and we know that this work is incredibly important. And then the December 15th workshop where we talked about our talent development and performance management framework for all of you um, to give you uh, an idea of what the competency model that we're standing up will look like, uh, what performance management, the framework and the tools that we're developing will look like. And so today we wanted to talk about the other two action teams um, that were incredibly busy um, prior to COVID, putting together recommendations around uh, the work or the service delivery model, if you will, of general services, and then around the hiring process improvement. So those three action teams, talent development, work of general service, and hiring process improvement is where we started in terms of strategic HR. And so today I'm talking to you about those blue highlighted um, action teams and the work and where we're at re with regard to those. So First, the work of general services. Why did we want to focus on the service delivery model? Well, we have um, focus groups. We talked to a lot of our business partners um, prior to 
this work getting started around the things that that they wanted to see, the things that they felt like were missing, how we could better serve our customers. And what we found was that um, they were looking for uh, a team to really support their strategic priorities and their business outcomes. Uh, what we found is that that structure, and this was especially true um, during the COVID-19 response, is that it, it's not necessarily aligned to be able to support the service team model. Our team um, in general services for a long time had been um, department centric and had aligned to the, the different departments. And so one generalist may have three, four, sometimes five departments across several different service teams. And that became, I think, really difficult to be able to manage the business and help support those strategic priorities by the service team model. The second piece was really making sure that we were driving, driving high functioning operations. Um, what we needed to really understand was that the work of, of our HR team is very incredibly diverse across all of our teams. And we needed to better understand essentially workflow. Where do the handoffs happen? Where are they supposed to happen? How do we create a consistent experience, customer service experience specifically for those service teams? So that no matter what service team you're in, you know what type of service to expect from HR um, as you look across the many different um, diverse functions of HR. And then um, what folks were really looking for were strategic advisors. Um, I think what people had found in those focus groups is that we tended to be um, very rule bound. As you can imagine, HR does in many ways have to be rule bound, but oftentimes those rules um, maybe haven't been updated or that sometimes they served as barriers, right? To really driving business outcomes. So it's not to say that we certainly can't um, be rule bound and, and that we won't be rule bound. Uh, we absolutely will continue to have rule um, drive the, the operations of HR in many ways, but that we're using that compliance as a means towards impact and that we're really being forward thinking and outward focused. So yes, there are things that, um, that maybe we can't do, but looking for solutions, becoming solutions oriented, what are the things that we can do and how do we support the business areas um, to be able to be more strategic so that they can really serve our customers in the most appropriate way. So the other piece to that is looking at, you know, oftentimes HR and other areas as well um, are, you know, get caught in the cycle of like being a little bit risk adverse, doing things the way that we've always done them. Um, and so thinking about how can we do things differently and how can we use technology to really help us evolve and support the business areas and their needs um, in driving our, our organization and serving our residents first. So if we look at the service delivery work, we did work with um, ROIG as our consultants um, in this work and they helped. Uh, and with that particular team, that general services team, which was headed up by our general services manager, um, Jennifer Otley, and that group specifically looked at um, several different areas about how general services could really evolve and change their business model and do work a little bit differently to adequately get to those things that we, we just talked about. So there were a couple of things that we needed to do to really help support that. We talked about some high level HR organizational changes, um, talent team operational strategy and the organization structure of the talent team as a whole and um, the general services, like how they're uh, aligned and their plan for their work as well as we talked about specifically a talent acquisition plan, what we found is that folks were really struggling with um, recruiting. Uh, we often poster jobs. Uh, we do some, some outreach in terms of working with some of our partners on some things, but we don't necessarily have strategy, right, around talent acquisition. So how could we improve talent acquisition? And then looking at the roadmap. So I'll go through each of these um, deliverables to talk a little bit about kind of where we are in this. Um, with regard to the high level HR organizational change, um, and I, you know, I'm sure that you are all familiar with this, Sandy talked about it a little bit. One of the first things that uh, we felt was really necessary to do is um, basically hire two deputy directors to oversee 
uh, these two specific teams. The first is the talent team, which includes general services, our diversity inclusion and organizational development team, and our HR operations team. And the second team is the enterprise team, which includes labor relations and investigations, as well as our benefits team and our um, HCM, which is really our capability team that oversees all of our different HR um, systems to be able to support the work that we're doing. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the talent team, um, operational strategy and organizational structure. Uh, we brought in obviously the deputy director um, and we've spent some time looking at each of the functions of general services, diverse inclusion, organizational development and operations and really started to, to essentially peel back the layers of of what those particular teams were doing and helping to find the roles. Again, so we know when work really needs to hand off or when do we need to bring you know, our experts in diversity, inclusion, organizational development in to help um, provide us some expertise and consulting when we're working with managers um, through some um, performance concerns or something along those lines. When do we bring in um, operations to help support updating our policies or working through an interpretation of our policy. Um, so we basically took these roles and really outlined um, the focus of each of these roles to then better dig into the work specifically of general services. The next piece there then was to, to look at how, um, how will our general services area evolve and how will they become what we're calling business partners um, that's pretty standard in, in HR now is a business partner. We really want somebody to work strategically alongside of our business areas or departments and service teams to really help them achieve their goals. So the way that they went about doing this, that um, particular action team was looking at our current state and identifying our current work, um, understanding what the gaps in our service delivery model was um, some of those barriers looked at our structure of that general services team, um, where time was being set, set, spent, excuse me, in terms of the work that that general services team was doing. And then where could we upskill or develop um, our general services um, our, our general services team members as well. And then so putting together some solutions, looking at a roadmap of what steps are next and really helping to create that future state for that business partner. So as I mentioned, we started with a talent team. The primary reason we started with the talent team and general services specifically within the talent team is that they are the primary contact for departments and employees. So the first person oftentimes if a department encounters um, some concern or they wanna talk through you know, hiring or something along those lines, or even for employees, right? If they have a concern or they wanna talk through something related to HR, their primary contact oftentimes is going to be the HR generalist. So we started with that general services team because we felt that that would make one of the biggest impacts. And we also heard from our business partners oftentimes that there, there were some pain points, right? That they wanted, as I mentioned in the beginning, they wanted to kind of um, have us really focus on. So the purpose of this, this work stream really is to create a vision about how we transform services to be able to support our strategic goals in the county. Um, as I mentioned, with regard to the structural changes uh, with the general services um, specifically, is that the current service model um, in many of our teams uh, across HR is really department centric. So a person, a generalist, for instance, will be assigned, as I mentioned, many different teams across many different service areas. And as you can imagine, that often creates a lot of difficulty in being able to balance the work and being able to help the service team specifically prioritize what needs oftentimes needs to come first. It also um, limits our ability to help that service team strategize. And it also um, did not support an ease of communication or has not supported in in my mind, especially as the deputy director, an ease of communication across the structure. When we're communicating changes from a service team perspective or a particular department um, within a service team, we often had to pull in you know, five different generalists because they all somehow um, touched that particular area. And then we'd have to pull in two supervisors and two managers and it, it just, it wasn't working well. 
And so what the first thing we did was we had two managers over the general services area who then had teams of generalists underneath them. And what we did is we moved to a one manager model, moved to the other manager over our operations area. And this um, general services manager is then supporting um, supervisory level um, individuals who are supporting the general services team. And um, so we have one supervisor or senior level business partner as the point of contact or will be the point of contact per service team. We haven't quite finished this yet. Um, and then each team will support each other in the service team model. So to give you an example of what that looks like, um, this is just what we've designed as the recommended structure for general services. And we're working right now on our change and transition plan. And we'll be transitioning over the next um, month or two, um, hopefully to be, ideally it would be completed by the end of quarter two, uh, but we'll really begin in that transition here at the end of quarter two to then um, align those, those generalists to um, the different service teams. So you have the manager of general services and in alignment to that we've grouped um, the different service teams um, as appropriate. I mean, we don't have right five supervisors, so we can't have one um, senior business partner for each particular service team. But what we did is kind of group uh, service teams together that made sense. We looked at things like complexity, the number of asks in terms of, of hiring or um, the size of the organization and those types of things. And then we aligned um, business partners to to each of these areas. And so again, we're, we're working on this structure to take who's in our general services roles right now and align them appropriately as makes the, the best sense without um, creating you know, a lot of uh, chaos or confusion for our departments. And so we'll be working um, through those pieces with the change transition plan to be announced by the end of quarter two here. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. And, I think this will make it um, a lot easier for us to be able to communicate changes or strategies in HR around um, focusing really in on those service teams. The next piece of this then is the work around um, upskilling our folks to the HR business partner. Um, some of the things that folks looked at was our current state of work. What are we doing now? Um, what are the categories of work in terms of being a business partner, and we identified uh, five sort of main buckets, right? So looking at business partnering, um, helping to really identify what are the strategies and priorities of that business team or that particular department and looking at uh, where are the concerns around um, jobs that have high turnover, where are those um, issues of like succession planning, how do we support, if, it, if a department is growing, how do we make sure we support that? If a department is restructuring, how do we, from an HR perspective, um, support that as well? So really being that partner at the table to help plan those things out and help identify any gaps that they may have in their workforce to make sure that they're meeting their goals. And then um, around employee engagement and team culture. So really working closely with uh, different teams across uh, departments and service teams to help coach and develop leaders on culture and engagement issues, uh, making sure that we're really creating and improving upon the employee experience uh, within talent planning and acquisition. So making sure that we have the right people in the right roles at the right time um, and that we're looking ahead, right? In terms of, do we have succession planning needs or other workforce planning needs? And then we do have um, a lot of, we do coaching a lot of the times uh, with managers and supervisors about how to approach maybe a performance concern or how to work with staff in terms of development, how to recognize staff um, is really important. And then how to make sure that we are um, appropriately evaluating our staff as well. And then the last piece there is working closely with our labor relations area and making sure that we're collaborating with leaders on any labor relations issues. What we found as we assess this work is that really we're spending almost two thirds of our time in talent planning and acquisition. So looking at um, the position, is it the right classification, um, changes to job descriptions, working closely with the business area on that, um, getting those jobs posted, you know, potentially getting them out to different um, mechanisms by which we can communicate those job postings. 
uh, and then working through with the areas around that hiring process um, specifically. So because we're spending so much time there, we do not have a lot of time to spend in these other areas. And, and when we did the focus groups with our business partners, um, supervisors, and managers across the organization said, hey, we really need more help around some of these other categories of work. So with that, um, one of the things that we have begun to do is look at um, a talent acquisition plan. How do we help support that general services team in developing our talent acquisition strategy so that they're not necessarily caught up in, um, in having to post jobs um, and recruit for jobs and uh, work through the process necessarily, but that they're, they're on the front end in terms of strategizing which jobs are appropriate, um, is the classification make sense, and then um, you know what happens from there. So we talked a lot about one of the things that's going beyond job postings, right? We know that recruiting and talent acquisition really is a full-time business. Uh, we hire anywhere from 300 plus. I would argue that we probably hired way more than that. We're still working on our workforce statistics report um, right now. And so we, we uh, are looking at how many we hired during the COVID response, but it was significantly more, right? As we stood up like housing operations and, and those kinds of things. So. Um, it really is a full-time business if you want to do it well. Uh, recruiting generally happens through word of mouth. So how do we proactively position ourselves as an organization that wants to be competitive and marketing ourselves as an employer is really incredibly important. And so one of the steps that we took, um, and we're going to be working closely with the communications team, is looking at how we develop our employer brand over you know, this next year or so. Um, looking at, of course, that it's not just um, this buzzword, right? We don't, we don't want to just talk about um, our employer brand, but we want to tell the story of what it means to work at Ramsey County. How do we begin to build trust with our communities? How do we begin to engage with our community um, to help them understand how you apply for jobs at Ramsey County? Um, how do we, how do we get the word out and go into the community versus always making the community come to us so that we can really be competitive in this market. The reality is, and we all right, talk about this all the time, there is going to be a labor force shortage. Um, I would argue that we're experiencing that right now for many jobs um, and that we really need to um, continue to remain competitive, especially with our other public sector partners, uh, whether it's helping um, to partner and, and develop staff together so that we create a strong government uh, community, but we also want to position ourselves to be able to attract, right? Not just um, active job seekers, I think that's really important, but I think one of the things that we often miss is are the passive job seekers who are oftentimes happy in their positions, but, um, but how do we tap into folks that are incredibly talented, right? That we want to bring um, into the Ramsey County family as well. So thinking about what does that look like and how do we tell our story and working with communications on that, um, we're gonna start um, venturing on uh, soon. So I'm excited about that. And then looking at um, education, as I mentioned, the process can be incredibly overwhelming. How do we help simplify the process of applying for jobs in Ramsey County? And then how do we make sure that we are providing education or tools so that we can make the process a lot less cumbersome or scary. And then finally, um, utilizing creative methods of talent acquisition. So hear a little bit more from our um, public pathways coordinator later, um, but we are partnering with some other folks, especially Ling Becker and Workforce Solutions to try to think and come up with um, creative ways of talent acquisition. So part of this um, deliverable is creating that roadmap. And so I just wanted to give uh, you all um, a, a view into like where we are and what's happening right now and where we're going. Um, the first step really is to align the managers appropriately who will use two managers over that general services team. We wanted to make sure um, that we align them appropriately so that they both have very um, distinct functions. Uh, step two of that is aligning them the general services team to the county service team model. Uh, we are hoping to be done with that in the next, um, or at least started with, uh, with that at, by the end of quarter two. We are working on our change 
and transition plan right now. Uh, our step three will then to begin to build out that town strategy, starting with public pathways um, as well, and then engaging our DIOD and operations about how they support the general services team in talent, um, the talent acquisition and in retaining uh, performance management, all of those pieces of the life cycle that are part of that talent strategy. The next step will be to assess and explore um, how we help support and develop our, our journalists into a, the business partner um, and where we can help take some work off their plate. And we are exploring the creation of a talent acquisition team or um, individuals to take on that talent acquisition piece to be able to shift the focus of our generalists to the other categories of work that we talked about that folks have been asking for and that we feel are missing. Um, and then the next step will be to then look at our DOD teams and our operations team and make sure that we are um, essentially being thoughtful and integrated um, and that we know where the handoffs occur and how can those teams really help support um, standing up the talent strategy as a whole. And then finally, that last piece is building out a toolkit for our supervisors for each part of the employee life cycle. So building in some tools for supervisors and managers um, to really help support them through each, each of that piece of the life cycle. So Anne, I just wanna appreciate all that you have shared with us already. Uh, thoughtfully planned and uh, shared today, but I just want to take a break if we can. There aren't any hands up right now, but I'm inviting them. We've taken quite a bit of uh, information in, and I just want to check in to welcome any questions at this point or clarifications or comments with respect to what you've presented. Is that okay? I am looking. And I see people who are locked and focused in, have taken a breath to take it all in, but I have no questions to present at this time. So thank you. Thank you. We can move on. Thank you. It is a lot of dense information. So thank you. <laughs> of the next work stream, and I am going to go into this again at a high level of detail. Um, was handled by our hiring process improvement action team. Again, several members across the HR team and a lot of improvement goals were identified with four sort of key focuses really at the core of this as they looked at the hiring process and they mapped out the entire hiring process that took up an entire wall, right? About how, you know, what this looks like and what role does each person play within the hiring process. And it was, it was pretty amazing um, to see that work. So the four core pieces that that team really kept in mind as they were planning out the recommendations uh, were, were around equity, ease, um, expediency, and consistency. So making sure, again, that we're creating an equitable process that is easier or more simplified to follow, um, that we can get through, I don't want to say as quick as possible, but that we, you know, we are continuing to move through the process so that we're not losing out on talent and that um, applicants have a consistent experience as well as the departments and the service teams when they're working with our, our team here in HR to make sure that they also have experienced a consistent process working through the hiring process. So, Wow, um, 26 recommendations in all. They're not really here at all completely. Um, what we did was kind of uh, divide it into or um, put it into buckets, so to speak. There are some recommended overall improvements that included developing training on hiring and minimizing bias in the hiring process for anyone who's participating in hiring panels. Uh, we feel that this is incredibly important both so folks understand the hiring process, but that they're thoughtful and can become more self-aware about the where there may be opportunities for bias and so that they can do you know, a self-check. Um, and so developing training around that is something that we wanna continue work on, working on in the short near-term future here um, so that all of our hiring panels or anyone who does any hiring can have that training. The next piece is around planning conferences with hiring managers about the process and the timelines. This is something that the team has already instituted 
Um, so one of the things that they do when they talk with the, the manager is here are all the, the steps, right? And the process, and here's how long each step is going to take. And so that they can get to that interview um, piece specifically, and then they can say, okay, I want you to block time off on your calendar for these interview dates. And then that way they can send it out early on in the process to anyone who's identified as part of that hiring panel. And that um, we're not, you know, racing at the end to try to figure out when folks could be interviewed or, you know, oftentimes um, we'd have to stagger over, you know, several different days uh, to have those interviews and, or maybe we couldn't have everyone participate. And so that, this was been a, a big thing. And then folks understand how long the hiring process takes, why it takes so long, what are those pieces? And we've received some really good feedback um, on that process. So that's been a, a positive change. The next piece around is um, including community as a partner in the hiring and training for panel interviews. Uh, we have incorporated that into much of our hiring, especially in positions where an individual who's being hired will work closely with community. Uh, we are exploring essentially a, a policy around this in terms of you know, compensating community for their time where it's appropriate. It may not be appropriate in all cases, but looking at, you know, nothing is, you know, a person's time is valuable, right? How are we valuing our community partners? Can we um, make sure that we are appropriately compensa compensating people for their time where there's no conflict or, you know, something else along those lines, but, but putting something together around that piece as well. The next piece around that is then fully developing out a talent acquisition plan. Um, it's interesting that these two action teams had very different work, but their main, um, one of their main recommendations out of both of these teams was like, hey, we have to get more serious and we need to do more planning around the talent acquisition piece. So I thought that was, that was really interesting. Um, the next sort of area of improvements was really focused on the internal HR process. So looking at creating standard metrics, and honestly, we looked at that even across the HR work as a whole, right? It's part of our foundational excellence, our move to create essentially um, a data-driven HR office. So looking at what are those standard metrics within HR that we should be um, assessing ourselves against and moving towards is a really um, important piece of that. And we are working on that to to move um, some pieces so that we can bring somebody in who has that data analysis experience and be able to start to create some of those internal metrics and start reporting on those um, in a dashboard sort of format. We are also, um, and have been for some time, cleaning up our NeoGov, which is our recording, uh, our recruiting system. There's a lot of confusion that was created. I think sometimes for newer generalists that were coming in, we had. Um, some older templates and things like that. And so really cleaning those up. And I think most importantly um, in number five there, along with cleaning up those templates was what are the communications that we wanna be giving to our applicants? Can we make sure that our communications are aligned with our values? And so even if we are sending out a standard um, communication that it is conveying that our applicants are important to us and that we hope this is a good experience, even if somebody, um, you know, maybe gets turned down for a job, right? Because we don't want to alienate people so that they don't come back and apply um, for another position again. We looked at um, our scoring format and we have um, what we call supplemental questions that are scored. It, the technical term in that is often called training and experience exams. But looking at how do we make sure we make the scoring of those supplemental questions that applicants submit uh, more uniform and then provide training. So um, that is one of the recommendations that came out of there. Creating a list of common supplemental questions. We do have a current list that's ongoing, but adding to that, making sure that our supplemental questions are, are valid and validated. And then looking at um, process documents and training for HR, making sure that we are um, preparing our, our staff well to be able to work through the hiring process. Um, and then developing a standard operating procedure for approving salaries. There has been in the past some tension and some bottlenecks in the process. We are working to make that better. And then finally, um, 
developing a standard onboarding process, which this piece right here is probably one of the more, most exciting pieces to me. Um, we are onboarding process right now. And, and when I talk about onboarding, it's from the time we offer a person to hire, get them into our system, um, bring them in the first couple of you know days, have them fill out all the paperwork. All of those things are really manual. And so we, um, with the help of the technology governance committee who um, was able to give us some money to do a discovery process, we've been working through identifying technology solutions that are gonna make sense uh, so that we're not making errors when people first come in, that we're creating a consistent experience for applicants and that we can develop other tools in that onboarding um, to make sure that folks get, you know, signed up for a new employee orientation or um, have some sort of standardized things, uh, plans for onboarding so that supervisors and managers have, you know, something at their fingertips to be able to guide their employees through a consistent onboarding experience. So we are almost complete with that discovery process work and it's, it's really exciting to figure out where we're gonna go with those next steps. Some of the things that I wanted to talk with you all today about commissioners is around the applicant experience um, recommendations that also came out of this. And again, there were several more, but I wanted to highlight um, a few of these here for you today. One of the things that we um, did currently on the application to make it both friendlier to our applicants, but also to make sure that we are not perpetuating equities and earnings was to remove um, what is the salary entry from the job application. So if you were to go in previously into Ramsey County's job application, it would have asked you what your current salary is. And it was a um, entry that you had to make, you couldn't bypass it. And um, at one time we made it optional and now we've just completely removed it from the application. And we did that for a couple of reasons. There was a report that had gone to the legislature recently that had shown that um, it, that current salary information often biases reviewers um, and also um, biases them in basing how they look at their job offers, right? So that job offers oftentimes weren't set on um, necessarily a person's experience and education but was, ba was based on, you know, what were they making in their last job? And then, you know, is this job considered a promotion or not? Um, but what that did and what the, um, I believe it was uh, the Office of Justice, and I apologize, I, I don't remember the exact office, um, but what that did was perpetuate salary um, and often earnings inequities. Um, it has also become illegal in other states to ask for that salary information, and there's currently a bill in the Minnesota House. And so we just decided to be proactive and to remove it now from our job application. We also want to improve the candidate's experience in their initial salary offer um, negotiations. So when we were negotiating um, with candidates in the past, um, oftentimes if an individual said, well, I'm making this much in my current job, so can you come in at a higher salary? Our um, folks would ask for proof of that. It was very off-putting um, to applicants. It did take additional time, which held up the process. We've had candidates drop out um, who were you know, offered a job and they just said, really, that's crazy. I'm not gonna provide you with my current proof, right, of my current salary earnings. And so in an organization that values integrity, right, we want to lead with integrity and we want to lead with the fact that we are going to trust our candidates um, with what they say and then negotiate with them um, based, on, based on that conversation, right? And looking at other factors, which include their experience, their education, what is the market telling us? How, how is it equitable with the other positions that we have in that particular area or across that job classification, which are really the things that we should be looking at anyways. The next piece is around allowing lived experience as a substitution for job experience where appropriate. So um, we heard this loud and clear from our Equity Action Circle um, Workforce Committee group and from others that we've worked with across the organization that oftentimes, um, 
a barrier to employment was that individuals didn't have work experience necessarily, but have lived experience. So we're looking at ways to do that. We are expanding our fellowship program as well to include lived experience. And as we are in the process of updating our job classifications to the new Gallagher job classifications, we're looking at what is appropriate in terms of substitution and looking at um, lived experience. Some other counties are doing things along this line too. How can we incorporate that into accounting for meeting those minimum qualifications? The um, next piece there is around credit for Public Pathways Program and Temporary Employment with Ramsey County um, in our training and evaluation process. So when an individual applies for a job, if they have participated in Public Pathways or Temporary Employment, we're saying we want to give them points to award um, for that so that they can um, eliminate that barrier to permanent employment with Ramsey County where oftentimes maybe they, they don't score right as high as others who have more experience. But if we're gonna grow our own talent through public pathways and temporary employment opportunities, then you know, we really need to be committed to how we can retain individuals who come in through those opportunities. So this is um, something that we're working on with our group to figure out what does that look like? How do we make sure um, that we are uh, benefiting folks who are participating in those programs? Uh, we have done that already for the public pathways, um, but we're looking at temporary employment as well. And so we're trying to figure out, you know, how does that make, how do we make sure that the points we add will actually bump people up so that um, folks can have opportunities for permanent employment. And then the last piece there is to explore and develop a process for blind application review. There's a lot of research around this area that shows that oftentimes people's addresses or applicants' names um, can be a barrier to employment um, because you know, people have biases, whether often conscious or not, right? And so um, we have tested this with a few jobs, but what we're looking to do is expand this use more broadly, um, maybe even potentially to all jobs. We're still trying to define what that process looks like. Uh, but we have piloted this, it has worked well. And so looking at building out those guidelines for usage um, in probably 2021, um, probably towards the end of the year with all the work we have in our plate. So just a quick roadmap, um, we've really been engaged in looking at, um, again, how do we ensure a positive and equitable experience and improve efficiencies because we don't wanna lose individuals through the process. And the first step of that has been, let's implement those things that are easy to do right now. And so we've been in the process of doing that. Um, some of these things I talked to you about today and then prioritizing the other recommendations and building into our implementation timeline, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, and then um, really working on how do we make sure they're implemented consistently across the work of general services or talent acquisition and then finally, that last step will then be to build that training for our, our hiring process. So I do want to pause there, if that's okay, Chair Carter, and ask if anyone has any questions before we move to the um, integrated TARP phase. All right. Thank you very much. Again, it's been substantial information that you've provided. Uh, certainly glad to continue to hear increased utilization of the term customer within this context and service delivery as a growing concept as you identify the ways in which you can best deliver services as business partners uh, to our service teams and the departments within those service teams. I have a question and then I see that uh, another hand has raised, let me stop on, well, I'll go to Commissioner McGuire first, and then I'll ask my Thanks, thanks Madam. McGuire. Thanks, thanks, Madam Chair. And I, um, you may be getting to this, because as I'm reading the next step, the integrated implementation phase, my question does go around, like, how are we working with our current employees and, you know, helping, uh, you know, with all of this transition? 
because um, this is great work. I'm really excited about it. Thank you so much for it all. You know, we all we already have a really great employee, you know, group, and and I know that they're all working hard. And so then to see a lot of change, you know, is sort of um, gets I think gets people nervous or they you know they um, wonder if they've been a part of it and all of this. So could you just talk a little bit about how our current employees have been a part of this whole structure and how they're going to be a part of it moving forward and you know, I, as some of these positions take shape and take a different shape, there'll be some changes, right? So then will people be applying for these new jobs? You know, they're in a current job, they'll be applying for another one. Just if you could talk a little bit about that. And if you're getting to that, I, I'll wait. If, if that's the whole next set, segment of a presentation, I'll just wait. No, absolutely. I think um, communication is key. And so I, I hope that we've done a lot of communication commission required. Thank you for that question. Um, but I mean, you're absolutely right. I think one of the things that um, those action teams, you know, were made up of uh, employees across our HR team specifically. So individuals um, across the team had input into these recommendations. And um, as we work in kind of realigning, reorganizing the team right now, uh, we've asked for input on that team about kind of preferences about maybe where they'd like to go or who they'd like to support. Um, I know a lot of uh, generalists have very good uh, reputa or rep oh yeah, reputations, but very good relationships, right? With their particular areas that they're supporting right now. And I, a lot of, of folks, right, are a little bit nervous about supporting maybe somebody new or different. And so we certainly don't want to um, give a generalist, a, you know, several different departments, but how we're looking at how can we refocus um, our team's work while having the least amount of impact, but still supporting the service team. So knowing that there'll be some new things, but hopefully some things that they're also familiar with. Um, as we look at, you know, uh, creating a development plan, I think we're at a stage where um, in any job, right, if you haven't um, spent a ton of time in, in development, that, you know, that's really where we want people to start. So giving folks, well, identifying, right, what gaps we have, um, definitely getting input from the generalists and what type of development they need as well. And then working to provide that development over the course of several months, probably even longer. Uh, no one is obviously going to be moving um, their particular position, just their service teams and their, um, you know, maybe the department specifically that they are that they are supporting right now. Um, as we look at standing up a talent acquisition function with some resources there. Um, certainly we're looking at does, do those particular positions align with our current general services positions? If they do, would our general services um, folks be interested in moving into a talent acquisition space? Um, there are also folks in our exams area who may be interested in moving up into talent acquisition. But I think that's one of the key things is we're working with our, our change manager to start developing a change plan and then um, bringing that transparency to our general services team and, and other areas of our HR team who might be interested to say, here's the plan, this is what it's gonna let you look like um, and making sure that folks have opportunities if they want to, right, to learn more about the positions and um, potentially move internally. Uh, we haven't fully fleshed that out, what that'll look like yet. We really wanna realign the, serv the general services team first to the service teams and then begin to plan out that talent acquisition work um, and then work with the, the teams around that to make sure that they understand you know, how we're gonna get there, what the process will be in engaging with them. Well, I really appreciate that, Anne. And I, my work with you has been amazing. You've just done a great job, the work that I've seen you do. And I know that everyone you know, is really gonna work hard at that. And, and I think, you know, we are going to see some of these positions change. And I think, I think our employees, you know, they want to do good work. They want to feel valued. They want to make a difference. And so if we, you know, bring, 
bring them all along in this process as you've just if you just identified i think that's a really good good thing because change can be hard but it also can be a really good thing if it if it means people are you know doing better work that they can feel good about i think it it can be a you know a, it, it can be a positive thing and so i think that's the goal is to make sure that it's a positive so thank you thank you commissioner mcguire i am certainly glad commissioner mcguire that you asked that question uh, about the involvement of current employees and how this information rolls out and they understand the pathways that may exist within this particular line of work that we're talking about uh, for our human resources area. And I also appreciate the recommendations that have been put forward. I wanted to ask a question that might be somewhat similar as you look at, for example, uh, the recommendation that current salary not be included. I was wondering how that would be, how that would apply to current employees and how the entire process would apply to the, the process of changing work or promotions within Ramsey County where that salary might be required or where any of this work, considering um, outside experience or lived experience, for example, for a current employee who is looking for new work. So could you just address that? And that's within the broader context, of course, of all the work Absolutely. that we be looking for. Yeah, Chair Carter, that's, um, it's a really good question. It's one we get, we get asked a lot. So one of the things that we're doing through the Gallagher work is specifically looking at our personnel rules, because as you mentioned, right, for our current employees, um, your current salary in Ramsey County essentially dictates where you will land for your next job, right? Because it's, you use what you're currently earning as sort of a reference point, and then you get like a bump of two steps or something along those lines as you move up um, in the organization, get a promotion, um, those kinds of things. So one, one of the things that we are doing right now is a group of folks led by one of our general services team members is um, working on uh, revising based on Gallagher's recommendations, our um, personnel rules uh, around this, around salary setting specifically, and making sure that we're aligning with um, statute and rule around not asking, I mean, obviously it's our organization, we know what people are making, right? But that we're holistically considering someone's experience. I think that's um, really important as a person moves into a different role. They might have had experience that maybe didn't account necessarily for their previous salary, but now it does. And so making sure that we're looking um, holistically at the applicant, whether it's an internal or an external applicant, and again, how does their salary equitably align with the others in that particular job class or in that area that they're going to. So it, it's a combination of factors, but looking at redrafting those rules in that way to support that, um, to make sure that these two things align appropriately. And so then um, obviously those things will be coming back to you uh, when we have a good um, draft that is ready for the board to, to look at and review and approve. So we are keeping those in mind as we're looking at our internal salary settings. That's good to know. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Looking back, we have no additional hands raised. And so I'm going to say we can move on. All right. Um, thank you, Chair Carter. So the next steps, and we've been busy at work, so it doesn't really feel like a next step here, but but we're moving uh, TARP themes one, two, three, and four really into this integrated implementation. And we're still trying to figure out, you know, what do we call this? Is it TARP integration? Is it one TARP? Um, but this work really is coming home essentially into HR. For the last year to two years, um, what really has happened is each of these themes led by our, our sponsors have been engaged in, in what I call a discovery phase, looking at um, the work that we're doing and recommendations coming out of each of these. As the recommendations are becoming finalized, 
Um, it is moving into the work of HR and how we really begin to implement all of this. And to do this, um, we've engaged a project manager and a change manager because as Commissioner McGuire mentioned, there's a lot of change, right? Happening and coming around this. And so for the next, um, or I should say for the last several months, uh, we have been um, producing or drafting, developing, I guess you would say, a TARP um, project plan or program plan really uh, that incorporates all of these different streams of work that have been identified in the themes that are now essentially coming home to HR to implement and looking at, okay, how do we prioritize these? Uh, we are in the last stages, so to speak, of finalizing that full project plan, which is, I don't, 230 plus lines of deliverables and things like that. So it's, it's big, but it's exciting. Uh, and we're able to um, prioritize, you know, what work needs to come first. And so what this next slide here is really showing you is that there are all these different pieces of the work within TARP that we are working on represented there by the gears um, and our values really centered in the middle of this, so to speak. It's sort of the main gear that turns everything and making sure that as we begin to implement this work, that we're implementing it appropriately so that all the gears work together uh, is really what this slide is, is trying to show. So looking at fully developing out our talent strategy, fully developing out our enterprise strategy. Um, we have a lot of system improvements that we need to be making. And then really making sure that those personnel rules, policies, and the classification and comp structure all support, right? The personnel rules support all of these things. Um, and the class and comp structure aligns with our talent strategy, performance management. And so um, through the development of that project plan over this last quarter, it's been really interesting to see where we need to um, prioritize first and spend the time of our, you know, the time that we have in addition to our daily operational work, right? Where we can um, really um, make this move appropriately. So um, again, onboarded a project manager and change manager, Felice and Biz have been incredibly helpful in developing out our project plan we are developing a new governance structure as well and planning a transition from the um, four sets of sponsors, so to speak, into one governance structure so that that team can help make sure that HR is pr prioritizing appropriately and also helping us to remove barriers where we may get stuck in the work. And then um, the last piece there is, is developing fully that project plan, um, which we have done and we have now develop status updates. And so we're hoping to communicate more regularly um, with the county and also with our leadership here to understand where we are at the work um, with regard to TARP. And Anne, before you say anything else, I mean, just on the whole thing, if you remembered one bullet point today, I would ask it be number two on that slide, which is this is the moment after three years of we had four deputy county managers asked to lead individual buckets of this work to get it moving. HR has now stepped up and raised their hand and said, it's time for a countywide governance structure. It's time to bring this work home and make it a part of what we're gonna do going forward. That has not been an easy transition. It's been six months behind the scenes of how to wrangle through thinking that through to make it happen, which is a sign that it's real. And it'll be a part of the budget conversations this summer as well, as we talk about how we're making sure it's resourced effectively and sustainable. But I just wanted to stop on that point because the big deal for those who have been here since the beginning. Thank you, County Manager O'Connor. Um, before we move to Public Pathways, I do want to acknowledge the incredible work in particular of the General Services team led by Jennifer Otley, um, the Operations team led by Jean Gramling, the DIOD team led by Maria Sarabia, who, um, and the Systems team, Tammy Lafort's team, who has been helping work behind the scenes to help support all this work. Others across HR are absolutely involved. The team as a whole has been amazing. Those teams specifically that I mentioned have carried a large part of the weight of all of the TARP work for the last year through COVID. 
who've kept it moving, who've kept it going. Um, I hope that I didn't miss anybody, but really uh, um, kudos to this team who has really hung in there and, and kept, you know, even though we're a little bit behind, has really kept stuff on track um, as we also responded to COVID and kept daily operations running. Are there any questions before I transition to public pathways? Thank you. I have Commissioner McDonough. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. I just, you know, I didn't ask any questions coming through and I actually had a chance to go through all the slides um, before the workshop. But I just, I just wanted to make a quick comment. I, there's a lot here and I really appreciate the update, but I'm fully supportive of this path. I think there's really a lot of good stuff here and it shows um, the commitment and the work of all the folks that have been a part of this and this evolution and this journey here through this, uh, you know, from where we started to where we're at today with the recommendations and then actual implementation plan. And yeah, there, there's a lot here and there's a lot of change and, you know, I appreciate Appreciate that you're sensitive to that, but um, this is going to be really critical for us for moving forward in Ramsey County on how we're going to participate in the workforce, in the job market, how we're going to be responsive to, you know, residents in our community that are looking to us for expertise and the service we pro provide. And I think it's all been taken, you know, all covered here. Your slide with the gears there, and and uh, you know, I appreciate that the values center that and drive that and remind us every day that why we're doing this work that we're doing but there's gonna be a lot of change here and and moving of cheese for folks and consternation and you know um i just want to make sure that you know that i support this work and for all the folks that are working on this that this is good stuff thank you commissioner mcdonough and that is our question before moving on thank you Thank you, Chair Carter. Um, so we turn uh, in light, wanted to give you an update on the Public Pathways Program, which really is part of the talent strategy. Um, and I'm sure you all remember in 2020 and 2021, it was a priority to intentionally diversify our workforce, always a priority, but specifically around public pathways and to help streamline these existing efforts, um, both to provide or create entry points um, for individuals into the county, but then also to develop an advancement in lateral ways to leverage our own staff talent. And so $500,000 have been committed to the Public Pathways program and six FTEs um, were approved by the county board in our biennial budget for 2020 and 2021. Um, just a quick update on, um, we had spent $25,000 uh, committed specifically to a legal position with St. Thomas. Uh, we did work in 2020 with an immigration clinic um, with that particular position. And then in 2021, we have brought in um, a policy or legal fellow that was working across the strategic team being shared by um, policy um, and planning as well as human resources and compliance. And so um, that's been incredibly helpful to our work. Uh, it again, not necessarily paused um, because of COVID, but um, I'm going to introduce you to our Public Pathways Coordinator who's hired at the end of 2020, um, Noelana Gates, who has uh, done tremendous work as an HR journalist for the past five years and continued to support her department as we onboarded uh, new journalists to take her role and has recently within the last just couple of weeks fully transitioned over into public pathways. So we're really excited that she's here and she's really here as part of um, coordinating this program so that efforts fall under one umbrella because what we've discovered is um, departments kind of engage in different opportunities across um, department and or across the organization. And what we really wanna do is put some structure around it again, so that we can create a consistent one Ramsey County experience for interns or workforce participants or fellows who come in um, and engage in the Public Pathways Program and participate in it. And so we're hoping uh, really to help the service teams leverage these opportunities 
so that we can bring diverse talent into Ramsey County. So with that, I'm going to introduce you and pass it off to Noe Gates. Noe? Good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to be here. So again, as Ann stated, my name is Noah Lana or Noe Gates for short. Um, and just to recap, the, the main purpose of the program is to really provide that support to our service teams and the overall organization and in intentionally and meaningfully diversifying our workforce, as well as aligning all those efforts that are occurring across the county. Um, and then to de develop in the advancement and lateral opportunities for our staff and really leverage the staff talent that we have, broaden, it, broaden the skills of our entire workforce and truly invest in and promote the, the overall development of our staff. Hey, Noe, before you dive in, just I want to add one piece on the FTE front because it's a good like budgetary piece to check in on. So the FTEs authorized are so we can have people rotating in and out of positions across the funding helps to fund pathways, but we have to have a place to park them within the board's overall complement for the organization. And so the FTEs get rotated in and out like the finance fellows where we have an additional six FTEs that exist. So there's about a dozen pathway positions now across the county. And that's why as you're wondering how many people where and stuff, really in many ways, these FTEs are what allow you to have the complement to park people in the pathways program. Thanks for providing that clarity. Um, so at the heart of this slide, you'll see ladders and lattices. So this is kind of the structure of our program currently. So the ladders are the creating those entry points into the county with intentionality at the forefront and making sure that we're using our best practices and to diversify our workforce, but also to really collaborate with our community. So under the ladders and lattices, you'll see those the example of the entry points. So we have internships, like our general student internships that occur within the departments, our progressive internship program with Metro State and St. Paul College, as well as the up and coming Board of Commissioner internship program. And then we have our fellowships. Um, so the finance fellows, environmental health, and some of our policy fellows as examples. Um, another entry point will be our work experiences or apprenticeships. So working with Workforce Solutions and the participants in those programs, as well as our um, collabor collaborating with Hired and PPL to do things like job shadows um, and those type of work experiences and utilizing student workers as well. Um, and then we have our typical um, employment opportunities. So that might be external employment opportunities as well as our internal career development for promoting and um, transferring our current staff. And in the upper left pink box, you'll see the data and measurement. So that's making sure that we're capturing our data and ensuring that we're measuring our hiring and retention and utilizing the tools like the workforce statistics report um, to really obtain the goals that we have set um, as well as being transparent and reporting out. So to identify the areas that we're doing well in as well as focusing on some of those areas that um, could use a little bit more development. And in the right, upper corner, you'll see learning and development programs. So that's just representing that we're engaging with the IOD to make sure that we're able to grow our internal staff. So they have the career ladders and um, general opportunities to, prog to progress through our organization. So my current focus right now is to really establish the umbrella over all of the pathways or the entry points into the county, leveraging what we, what we have, um, and then creating that routine cadence. From there, we'll then really focus more on that lattice piece um, to grow and promote from within. So in essence, putting a structure around what we have, figuring out what our other needs are, and then expanding beyond that. Um, at the bottom, you'll see the outreach portion. So these are other events, things like sitting on panels to promote Ramsey County, um, workforce development with our community partners, or participating in mock interviews, um, and having like, like direct community engagement. So working with EAC to flesh out practices that best align with our goals. Those are other ways that um, we'll be able to participate and enhance our collaboration and with our entry points. So this coordination allows for more consistency and structure for our participants um, and really will enhance the employee and participant experience. And so next we'll go over some of the highlights of the program. So right now, um, some of the recurring events that I'll highlight are our human services pathway, 
um, in partnership with PPL, our office admin training um, in partnership with Hired, um, and then the public sector employer collaboration with the talent pipeline management. So those are events that have continued over the years and that we've continued to work on this year as well. Um, and already mentioned one of our continued partnerships with the um, University of St. Thomas Ireland Fellow that we're currently sharing across the strategic team. Um, and then another one would be the progressive internship program that we have in partnership with Metro State and St. Paul College. Um, and then I'll highlight the, the, the developing partnerships aspect. So we've had a lot of conversations with local educational institutions and partners to discuss the opportunities that are in place or ways that we can build or enhance connections that we currently have. So an example of some of these partners would be McAllister College or St. Kate's Youth Prize um, and Public Allies Twin Cities. Some of a new initiative that we have with a current partner would be um, the CDL Pathway to Public Works Transportation. So that's with Hennepin County and PPL. And it's something that um, we're in current conversation with um, and to hopefully, hopefully utilize. Um, and then something that's really exciting that I enjoyed working on earlier this year was the Workforce Solutions Young Adult Career Academy. Um, and we were really prepared earlier in the year, but decided to reschedule it for um, mid to midsummer, just to ensure that we were offering and enhancing um, and providing the most and beneficial opportunity for the participants that will be in that program. So that will be starting soon. Um, one thing I do really wanna call attention to is the impact that the pandemic had. So we were able to adjust and adapt and what I like to say is more moving and grooving um, to continue to provide opportunities virtually. So things like the mock interviews, information, session, information sessions, um, providing the job shadow experience, as well as attending, um, participating and even hosting uh, job fairs. So we were able to just successfully participate in these and still lead in these areas. Um, so now that leads us to where we're headed. So we'll be launching a cohort model for our fellows and interns um, and be providing professional development opportunities. So we'll be able to provide wraparound supports that really foster um, that positive employee experience and connecting them with their peers that are going through similar experiences throughout the county that will build in that um, internal support. And additionally, providing visibility into the inner workings of the county, an opportunity to network with other professionals and leaders across the organization. And so this week, we'll be starting to meet with service team leaderships um, to really strategize the different pathways, opportunities that they can utilize in their area. So we'll be talking about current programs they're using or have used in the past, reviewing some of the workforce statistics data and having discussion around any questions they have um, as we plan to plan on their, the commitments to the um, pathways programs that they'll be using. Um, and we won't be dictating the opportunities that are used, but um, it is the expectation that each service team will leverage a public pathway opportunity um, to start in the fall of this year. And with that, I know I breezed through that just because I wanted to make sure we had enough time. Um, are there any questions from anyone? There actually are a number. And so I will be calling on commissioners. I just want to, in referencing the diagram that has public pathways program, note that the slide does say board of commissioners intern with an S. And at this point in time, I know there is an intention from my office to hire an intern for this summer, and we have been working toward it. I have mentioned it with other commissioners as an opportunity for our participation as we look at the opportunity for public pathways and, and to think about participating in that on an ongoing fashion. But this would be a beginning with an intern in my office, and I might add using savings from travel funds that have not been used this year. And with that, I'm gonna to turn to the screen for questions or comments. And first I have Commissioner Mattis Castillo. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I think you answered most of my question uh, with your comments, but just wanna confirm, are these internships all paid internships? 
um, is the first question. And then the second question is, how do the rest of us get interns in our offices? Uh, <laughs> um, is my question. And thanks, Snowy, for a really great presentation. And it's great to meet you uh, here at this workshop. Madam Chair, Commissioner Modest Castillo, I'll give kind of like the overarching answer on internships because there's a variety of internships a diverse organization like ours employs, right? So you've, you've heard about different types of programs today. We do departmental internships as well. And so I'll use social work interns as an example where it's actually not allowed to be paid in certain settings as a part of course credit. So there are times when we do not pay because of potentially like you can't do that for the standards of coursework. Um, we have most of our internships outside of those types of requirements at this point are paid. I wouldn't say everyone, there's always unique circumstances that come up. We are competitive in that market though, we pay well. And so, you know, I think the biggest thing also is we, particularly as you work with schools across the region, we support a lot of people. The traditional model of who is a student is so different than the reality on the ground for our organization. And you need to pay at a rate that allows people to not have to work three other jobs to be able to get work experience. And that's a serious part. We've actually been looking at our lowest end jobs and uh, that may be a conversation coming uh, up with the board, particularly around interns as we look at our low end rates for a few of our jobs and keep them market competitive in the coming months. And one follow up question if I might is, um, what's the age requirements for these internships? Are any of these high school internships or are they all post-secondary? Madam Chair, Commissioner Modest Castillo, we have student workers and interns under a slightly different designation. Most a high school student would often qualify as a student worker just based on skills experience requirements. Um, so that's not to say it's an age specific requirement. It's more of a skills specific requirement. And we do differentiate to try and bring in both. I think as an organization, my own, this is just my own like observation over the last eight years. Student workers have been tougher to integrate often into the day-to-day -day work. It requires some level of, in a lot of spaces, it's just tougher to figure out how to exactly integrate. We've had more success on the intern level, but um, working with St. Paul and to think about right track and the work with you lead out of workforce solutions has probably been our best avenue into working more focused with students. And I think that's the way that Ling would like to continue to see us push as well. Thank you for your questions, Commissioner. And I have on board Commissioner McDonough. Well, thanks, Chair Carter. Uh, it's good to see we've come a long ways in four or five years here. I can remember the early conversations on this and it was pretty haphazard what we did in the county and we've come a long ways and this is really a, uh, good work and a solid foundation. My question goes to, Ryan, you've touched on some of the various opportunities you mentioned there's about a dozen of these FTEs that are kind of plugged in that flow through the county. Have we given any, are we to the point where we're having some conversations um, about what is that sweet spot, right? We want to make sure there's value. We want to make sure that who's coming in is able to take something away from this, that they're adding value to the work that we're doing in the county and making sure that we don't water it down um, to the point where we're losing the value for us or for the individuals. Are we even getting close to that point yet um, of really having that conversation? Because I want to make sure it, it's at least in the back of somebody's head because this is really good work. And I can remember those early conversations with some of the folks and there was outright resistance because they just feared um, what that meant to them and, and to see the excitement. I mean, I can remember when Lee finally said yes to the, these financial people and it, it was like, yeah, this is the best thing ever. But um, I think we, you know, I just, I'm hoping we're thinking about what is that sweet spot? And how do we continue to make sure that this is a high level, high valued program? And, you know, if we need to grow it in ways that we need to support the infrastructure, how do we do that? So we're not maybe limited at, at a too early of a point. Um, Madam Chair, Commissioner McDonough, thanks for the question. And I like your count better. I think it's been like eight years we've been stumbling through this one. So we'll go with your number. And uh, I, gave, I gave you guys a couple of years. <laughs> Those early years when no one wanted to listen. <laughs> right, right, Raphael? Uh, I think, you know, and for a while, yeah, I was pushing to say bigger, bigger, bigger while having to think that through and now we got to think about scale size sustainability and effectiveness 
Um, I don't have a perfect answer today. It is absolutely on our minds. I think we're going to know a lot here on that final bullet as service teams really talk about project specific work this May. We are closer to a saturation point where it starts to become make work projects, which are not what we're looking for. Um, we have not gotten there yet, but I think we're going to know a lot better as we enter into this summer. And when HR is back as a part of the strategic team budget day, this is a good follow up to check in on and say how what have we learned so far would be a really good moment in time for us to talk about. Um, my sense is we're about right size with some of these additional FTEs and where we're sitting to really get project focused. Alongside that, the one spot I think we may still have a lot of opportunity to grow just from the initial conversations. I think the work that Director Becker is doing and trying to integrate across like with right track and really think through how to integrate workforce and you're at the web, you know, you see that work. I think there's a lot more to be done there than we've previously done. And so I do think on the high school end, not a formal, maybe just county program, but that is the space that we try probably to look at to grow next. You know, um, Madam Chair, if I could just do a follow up. Yes, Thank you, Ryan. I'm glad to hear those thoughts. And you're right. I think we got to get creative as we, how do we support? And so it isn't just make work for the individual or for our folks trying to manage that. And I really like some of those thoughts about getting creative and, you know, I think Ling's on the call, but being on the web, you know, what does it look like to actually partner where an individual might kind of share and, and move around within a couple of different organizations and get a little bit of this and a little bit of that to help them kind of sort out as they're thinking about their future, I think are some of the creative ways of, of continuing to have a high level program would help support that capacity issue so that we're not um, we're not falling down and, and helping ensure that we're supporting the folks that we're bringing on. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I will go to Commissioner Fretham. Um, thank you. Um, Tons of great work here, and I'm I'm on board with uh, Commissioner Mendes Castillo. How do we get interns? That would be awesome. Uh, would love an opportunity to work with and develop uh, young people. Um, I think my my question is if there's any either with the with the Pathways program any opportunity for overlap in some of the training that's being developed for um, board and commission members. Uh, it seems like some of that might be um, useful development. Uh, opportunities or just in general as as we're developing development work for our, for all staff will pathways program interns have the opportunities to to access some of those development tools while they're with us madam chair commissioner fredham so where you ended for sure the answer would be yes i can see one direction the the opportunities to so we've all had our own experiences in apprenticeships, internships, training opportunities in our own careers, right? And so you're, you're shaped by those, right? It, and I think a lot of it does come down to, and having worked with many different interns and students, when you bring them to a charter commission meeting, when you bring them to new employee orientation, when you let them go through the charter commission or the, the boards and commissions training work, those skills are as valuable as any project-based work. And so yes for sure and exposure needs to be a big part of the cohort and then cohorts allow people to learn the things they didn't even know someone else got to see i don't have as good of an answer in reverse like and i wasn't sure if you were asking bi-directionally but like the question around if charter if boards and commission members would benefit from this cohort model i hadn't thought about okay okay so yes then i'm in a full agreement with you on the mapping to that work and it makes sense and on the Commissioners and internships, I'll put it down as something to follow up with each of your offices on because there's always opportunities and uh, Noe and I will sell you on what we could do if you're willing to play a support role and be a mentor. Thank you. And next I have Commissioner McGuire. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Clearly this is a, the internship and mentorships is a, is a strikes a chord with all of us because I think we all get approached by really good people that want to intern with our offices. So I know I've had a number of interns that have worked with my office just because we supervise them, we do everything, we don't pay them. You know, they've just been able to spend a summer, you know, with credit, work credit or whatever. So, but it would have been so great for them to, you know, go into some, you know, fit in with some training model that could have 
could have helped them, you know, learn even more about the county. I think they all felt like they had, you know, a pretty good experience, but, you know, it was very, you know, basic with what my office, you know, could provide. And so I, I just hope that we're thinking in terms of, I, I understand that we want to have really substantive internships and mentorships, and we want them all to learn, but I, I don't know that they all have to be as as formal and as paid. And I mean, I'd love to give them a stipend, but I hope we're thinking about different types of these kinds of things. So that if someone does just want to have a summer internship and they can find their own credit and they just want to, you know, they're not going to do anything else this summer, but they want to spend a couple months. And if we're willing to work with them, it would be sure nice if they had some other things to key into in the county. And I'm just going to give another example, like, okay, so at the Capitol, at the legislature, you know, they bring in they bring in their pages for a week at a time. Now that's not what I'm suggesting here, but you know, they expose a lot of kids to that process because they have a very dedicated program to bringing in kids that, you know, they don't get paid of course, and it's just a week long, but they all learn so much about that process. So I'm not really thinking of that, but something similar where we could have more of a program where kids could really learn about county government and what it means and so i just hope we're brainstorming and i'm willing when you come to my office i'll i'll want to brainstorm things like that that kids and young young kids and college kids and older um i have a i have a number of other people that have said can i can i just intern for nothing because i'm looking for a job now and i have a couple months i want to just do something substantive and you know it's it is um and these are really amazing people. So yeah. just throwing um, that all out there too, that I think there is opportunities for us to be creative with this. Madam Chair, Commissioner McGuire, thank you for the comments. A couple of spots, I think generally we're in alignment. There's a couple of spots though as we build structures and programs where we have made some choices here and I wanna highlight those for you because they fit. Um, first, I've had to be conditioned to not say kids when it ties to internship and mentorship and just because <laughs> I was a kid doesn't mean, yes. no, I'm not, yes. I, I don't mean it I'm that sorry. way. I'm sorry, and I should not have said that. I, no, I should have no. said youth. I should have said high school. Yes, thank you for pointing that out. And and some of our most successful interns have been, you know, mid-career changing professionals who finally got a chance to go to school and things like that. So as we really truly think about how our community can be a part of our workforce in Ramsey County, that just has become a big part of our change and shift. Um, and yet we still work very closely with colleges, universities, and quote unquote traditional students pipeline from high school. Um, job shadows would fit more toward the criteria you defined about the capital experience. That's not, I would not consider that an internship. We do job shadows. And Commissioner Carter and I actually, right before the pandemic, got to meet with a group shadowing across a week in Ramsey County in different settings. It was a great experience. And then COVID showed up and uh, we have not gotten to build on that. But more of those opportunities should be a part of what we do. The final thing I'll say about paid and unpaid we are clearly moving to a place where we do pay on our internships. And the reason being is it changes the pool of who can compete and who can say yes to an unpaid opportunity. And um, some people are fortunate enough to be able to come from circumstances where they can get housing and they can get someone to float them and they can say yes to anything. And we see that that can perpetuate those same benefits. And it's um, simply paying. It's not a huge investment on the county side to pay for talent to pay for expertise. And I actually think we should continue to work with other employers to pay their interns as well, because it does change the pool of who we recruit. We can recruit then both the person who had the time and wanted to do it, but also some others who may not have otherwise considered. So that's the one spot where I think we have moved harder toward trying to pay. And, and I appreciate all of that. Thank you. That's all very well said. And I, I can't disagree with anything you've said. I think you're right. I think it all makes sense. So look forward to further conversations in this. So thank you. Thank you for the questions. I have no further questions up on the screen from commissioners or comments as it may be. So I, it is time to say thank you so very, very much for the work that you have done both in presenting uh, the TARP changes that we've had the opportunity to see today and also the Public Pathways Program. You know, I would say that May has been um, determined as a time when you're meeting one-on-one -on -one, and I wanna thank you for just volunteering to meet with commissioners too, as we think through our opportunities to perhaps become a part of 
bringing in an intern and working in concert with pathways. I don't think commissioners will always have interns. You know, I think that there are opportunities that come and go. We certainly uh, have had opportunities to in the past and we'll continue to look toward what makes sense in terms of adding value to an intern's experience and also getting work done potentially for us and also um, exposing young people and others to Ramsey County, the work that we do, the opportunities that exist for them for today and for the future. I wanna say a special thanks to everyone here that has presented and also a welcome to Noe Gates. Um, thank you so much for this new work in this area of pathways. And then I will turn back for any final comments uh, from the team. Madam Chair, I'll just say thank you. Uh, I will ask if anyone from HR wants to jump on and get the final word. You did all the work and I'd love for you to get the final word. Madam Chair, Commissioners, I think we've um, spent a lot of time here today and I'm most grateful for the time that you've given and the great questions that you asked of us. Anne or Sandy, is there anything final closing from either one of you or any questions? No, thank you, Gail. I just, I just want to again recognize the teams who have continued to um, move this work forward and acknowledge Noe's work uh, around this as well. And, and thank you all for your support, Commissioners. I really appreciate it. Again, thank you everyone for the fine presentation this afternoon and for the work in process. And with that, we are adjourned. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks. Good meeting. Thank you. Great job. Thank Good you. Work. Great Good meeting. Work. Thank you. Thanks thank you. so much. Thank you all. Okay.